And welcome back to another GAC podcast where we're going to be discussing games, anime, computers, and collectibles. Uh, but not necessarily all those in one week. I'm still your host, Harrison, and to my right... Boss Pander. And to my left... Hi, I'm Faust. And we're going to get into the news of the week. Though, you know, do we need to introduce the other person? Cat Thulu. He's ready for, you know, his close-up. He's staring <laughs> at the camera. Oh, Every week, it seems like. So, lately. He, he thinks he's the star. Well. He's the furry star. Speaking of um, stars, do we have um, anything that way with stars? With stars? Yeah. Uh, I'm not too sure what you're getting at there. I, I do know that the Kevin Smith is coming out with another Jay and Silent Bob movie. Oh mm-hmm. yeah, that's that's always good for a few uh, yeah few things. Right? Um, yeah, he is on record uh, saying it's a, a fun flick in which the Jersey Boys have to go back to Hollywood to stop a brand new reboot of the old Blunt Man and Chronic movie they hated so much. If you're not familiar with the original Jay and Silent Bob, <laughs> wait a minute. Back. So they're making a reboot to stop a reboot. Yeah, <laughs> that's very yeah. Kevin Smithy. Uh, it's a tongue-in-cheek, silly-ass satire that pokes fun at the movie business's recent redo obsession, featuring an all-star cast of cameos and familiar faces. And I already met with good folks at Miramax, and they're into it. So I'm hoping we'll be shooting in the summer. Never give up, kids. You can do anything you want in life, so long as you're patient and malleable. Do Kevin you, Smith. Do you think they're going to get uh, Mark Hamill to be Cockknocker again, or are they rebooting the Cockknocker also? Uh, they might. Well, they might be a, a reboot, and maybe ha- Hamill shows up to beat the crap out of the the new cockknocker. <laughs> <laughs> you know, well, they they say the favorite the favorite Kevin Smith movie is actually Dogma, so I, I like that one. That that's a that's, good one. That's a good one. Yeah, I I mean, no, that that's one you can kind of show to the family. Not Jay and Silent Bob Strike Back. Are you oh, kidding? Why not? That's good for the family. Yeah. My brother put it on for my grandmother. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't make it a minute into the film because you know how it opens up with Jay and Silent Bob basically growing up and out in front of the quick stop. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I think in that scene alone, they say fuck like uh, 30 or 40 <laughs> times. Well, that would get you censored on YouTube now. <laughs> so I believe the story goes that my grandmother watches that and she gets really quiet. And then after that scene, she pauses, it turns over and says, I don't want to watch this fucking movie. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like my grandmother. Yeah. My grandmother is the sweetest old lady you'll ever meet. But <coughs> yeah, the, the thought of her saying that is hilarious. My, my grandmother is not a sweet old lady. She did not cook cookies and cuddle us. No, she she was a mean old grandma. She'd grab you by the ear and beat your ass. Well, my grandma washed my mouth out with soap. Oh, yeah. Which was even more interesting that she would <laughs> do something like that. Well, speaking of things that are like mean old grandmothers, yeah. we have the internet uh-huh. being Ooh. like a mean old grandmother again. It seems Damn like that. Damn that internet. <laughs> so, everybody knows about Half-Life's announcement for their new card game. Okay? Mm. Half-Life or Valve? Valve. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So... Well, Valve is Half-Life, you mm-hmm. know? Um, and that's all that people usually think about. So they announced the, the new game, and it's a tie into Dota 2. And people were pissed because it wasn't Half-Life. Yeah. Well, because the new card game's not out yet, but it's a tie into Dota 2, the community is striking back by giving negative reviews to Dota 2. Mm-hmm. Because... It's not Half Life. <laughs> uh, I think this was more stormed about what we covered last week, where Mark Laidlaw kind of released a script idea, a full script idea for the episode three of Half Life, um, which he basically just called a fanfic because it was just something he had sitting around. And there's no real, uh, you know, there's no real way of identifying his motivations for releasing this kind of thing, or if it actually is an official script. It's in no way saying Valve isn't working on Half Life three. Which is a stretch. Yeah. <laughs> well, because Valve has said that they're essentially not working on Half-Life 3, you know, for quite some time. And this, you had this come out. You had them announce this uh, this card game. 
And, you know, the new form of pressuring companies is negative reviews. Mm -hmm. So that's why they are bombing, negative review bombing Dota 2, trying to pressure Valve into actually making Half-Life 3. I don't know if that's going to work. I mean, <laughs> I mean, it's it's worked in a couple other instances, such as when Grand Theft Auto Five, uh, their um, they took away some of the ability to, to run mods for a while. One of the popular mod packs, it started getting bombed with negative reviews, and the company re- relinquished and allowed that to uh, be done instead. Uh, so they brought back that mod pack uh, that was community developed that everybody liked. The the thing here is, you know, people really, really want Half-Life 3. Mm-hmm. Sure, getting this fanfic script, you know, lighted the fire again at the same point. But in something else, the community has decided they're doing a Half-Life 3 game jam. Basically, they're going to take the script and write uh, it into a video game for Half-Life 3. And they're uh, accepting proposals for that right now. So... You know, basically the community says, it's like, all right, Val, you won't give it to us. We'll make it ourselves. Yeah, but how good is that going to be? <laughs> it can actually be really, really good, to be honest, because, I mean, there's a lot of community-driven uh, remakes of games that are just as good, if not better, than the original. Um, there's a there's a um, Portal uh, Portal male stories that was done and it's actually pretty good i mean it's not up to the par but it's pretty well pretty good so would they, would they get by with this though if they tried to put something like this out wouldn't valve go after them valve's actually typically not gone after people like this um the thing about it is uh, to have an to have a game remain successful past its cycle past the release and the whole box office blowout that people are just buying up the game you really do need an active modding community that's how skyrim is still relevant you know, almost two decades after it came out, it's still and it's even being released on the Switch. They're call, they're they've added mod support on the Xbox One and limited support on the PS4. Um, it's the modding communities and the things that they do with these games that really keep it vibrant and alive. Because after you play the base game, which is a long game, you can put like 300 hours just playing the base game, mm-hmm. and you want to liven it up or you know break it or break it over your knee or whatever you want to do with it, you can go and find mods to do that. Even total conversions that add completely different stories. And it, it is a way for people to kind of prove their chops to game development houses and say, you know, hey, I put this together with me and my friends. You should hire me and I can do this professionally for you. So it's it's basically, you know, everybody has technically has access to the tools and information and knowledge necessary to create their own game or to create a mod, a, a part of a game. Yeah. And, and this, I mean, this is typically this comes down to the game developers to see who's going to be a dick about their intellectual property and who's not Mm -hmm. valve has been relatively open with their stuff they has been as well so valve there's uh, one called black mesa which is a remake of the original half-life in the half-life source engine and it's done gorgeously well and to the point where it's being sold on the it's being sold on uh steam and at an actual it costs money and this has the full blessing of valve so that's I mean, even the the current darling of online gameplay player unknowns battleground it started as a mod and then moved on to its own development we have DayZ, which caused a stir back in the day um and they created a standalone which unfortunately killed them but uh you know win some lose some uh currently on steam uh dota 2 is still sitting at a very positive overall review with eight, uh, nearly eight hundred thousand reviews well, um, except, ninety thousand of which are negative. Yeah, except for look. Yeah, look at the recent ones. I bet you almost all the recent ones, because usually those are the ones you see on the yeah. right hand side. Out of the twenty one thousand reviews that are recent, the results are down to mixed. Yeah, so they're doing some damage. Yeah, you know. and fifty nine percent of these reviews of tw- of twenty one thousand reviews in the last thirty days are positive. So. You know, more there are more positive reviews going up than negative reviews. I think this is more of a hit piece to try and and capitalize on the whole what seems to be a dis. Uh, uh, it. It's it's trying to play up the drama of Blade Law releasing this this thing out of some sort of spite towards Valve. It's like more, you know, this is something he probably put a lot of time and effort into, and he wants to see it out there so that people can enjoy it. And he doesn't think it's going to be something that Valve is going to make. 
Um, as I as I pointed out last week, I believe that Half Life Three is going into Duke Nukem Syndrome, where it's going to be it's something that's just going to be talked about and brought up over and over and over again. If it were in development at this point, they can't really do anything in a video game sense to make up for the promises and the um, speculation of the fans now. Well, okay, so the difference there is. Duke Nukem Forever was in a perpetual development cycle. Mm-hmm. Like it kept getting hyped and hyped, and the developers kept saying, "We're making this. We're making this. We're having to improve this. We're going back to a different engine. We're doing this. We're doing this. Give us money. You know, we're going to do this mm-hmm. and everything like this." But I, I believe the best analogy I heard it was it was trying to build a house uh, opposite of a boat floating down a river because it's like every single time the industry updated. With new engine or new graphics capability or new hardware capability, the Duke Nukem development team ended up shifting paradigm and trying to incorporate the new technology to remain current. You know, there's there's a lot of stuff I want to do, but nobody wants to give me money. <laughs> well, Duke Nukem, you know, I, I'm that initial that initial uh, build for it and everything they kept doing with it, it became like the Winchester House, you know. Yeah. So that's... It's, I mean, early early builds of the game that we're seeing were very disjointed, and it was very difficult to even try to keep up with what was going on. It's almost it's almost a mercy killing what Gearbox did, just buying the rights, putting out something, yeah. you know, and then retiring it. And the only thing that we've seen since then is the Duke Nukem Anniversary Edition. You know, this is the perfect time for another Duke Nukem game to come out with all the, uh, you know... With the, after this political season, yeah, because it does need to. It needs something sort of like that social commentary, self referential humor, <laughs> yeah, self awareness. Because Duke Nukem fits America yeah. just <laughs> really well. Okay, so I, 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 Gearbox, you're sitting on a million dollar thing right now. You know, thanks well, to the political climate. There, there is a certain amount of um, hedonism and misogyny that was apparent in the Duke Nukem Forever release that Gearbox came out with. Um, that didn't sit well with most of the audience. Wah. Yeah. Wah. And unfortunately, it's one of those things that, that came about in Duke Nukem 3D. Um, I recently had the pleasure of speaking to somebody uh, who had, uh, around the time the Duke Nukem Forever was getting hyped to no end, which is usually a sign it's going to be a bad game. Uh, he took it upon himself where everybody was trying to defend it and say that Duke Nukem is a bastion of game development and everything like that. It's like, maybe 3D. Maybe the original Duke Nukem's like created sort of a paradigm or something like that. But he put took it upon himself to play the twelve or so spin off Duke Nukem games that came about after three D. Yeah. That actually exist. They were on PS one, they were on PS two, they came out for Sega C D, Dreamcast, you know, like there were these there were a lot of these games that were just sh- shovelware. Yeah. And, and you know, that they were just trying to capitalize on certain things. And he, he wanted to point out, look, it's been destroyed already. Yeah, I mean, there's there's a lot here you can't recover from unless you just ignore that it happened altogether. Kind of like Sonic. <laughs> yeah, kind of. Uh, Except pretty that's... much anything that you keep doing over and over. Mm. What the definition of insanity? Yeah, just repeating the same thing, expecting mm-hmm. a different result. In this case, though, Sonic seems to have hit on a good thing because Sonic Mania is indeed causing mania. Well, that's because it's trying to ignore every other shitty game it's ever put out. Which is probably the best thing ever. <laughs> <laughs> the, the the problem with Sonic games is the problem, problem with any IP that kind of keeps up with it. The only one to really break that technically has been the usual uh, Nintendo IPs, which are Mario, Zelda, Metroid. No, no, no. There's bad Mario games. There's oh, okay. plenty of bad entries to these titles, yes. I mean, we've got, what, Baby Mario? Was that Yoshi's Story or Yo- something? Y- yeah, Aww. Yoshi's Story, Baby Mario. You had uh, Super Mario with Sunshine. Uh, you can technically argue Dr. Mario <laughs> and um, Yoshi Cookie were just sort of... <laughs> Yoshi <laughs> Cookie. Yeah. What about, what about uh, the, all the Mario Party games? Those are just amazing. Yeah, I, I like those. Yeah, those are amazing little party games. And the thing is, it doesn't yeah. have to be Mario, but having that there kind of ties it into the whole Nintendo line of things. And you have to understand Mario Party Mario Party games outsell every other game bar none because of their accessibility. Because people love to hate on each yeah. other. And there are I well, mean it's, it's fun and it's the Mario Party and the Pirate One piece goes in with that too where mm-hmm. you have the um 
I'm I'm not I'm looking at the dog off in the distance. I the oh, dog okay. was dream running. Mm-hmm. I, was, I, I didn't know if you're looking at the cat or no. But um, Seeing you the, have those, and it's like a party thing where you're competing, and it's 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 fun. I I I like those kind of games. Oh, they're just like they're just like Risk and Monopoly. You know, they're, they're oh yeah, you're <laughs> a real fun at a party. Those are boring. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's the same concept though. They they're the ones that destroy relationships. You know. I mean, if you go into a Mario Party game expecting to do that, then yeah, you can. But but Mario Otherwise, Party just... and Car- Pirates Carnival and stuff are fun when you're playing Risk and Monopoly. Those those are boring. I mean, that's that's why I made it a point. Even though there isn't a party out, I'm probably going to get Mario Party for my Switch. And I made it a point to get Mario Kart because that's essentially a more fast version of Mario Party where you're just you're racing against each other in a very simplistic sense. You know, speaking of the Switch, you know what else they're coming out with on the Switch? Yeah. Uh. No more heroes. Yeah. They're going to bring that back. Yeah, of course they were going to bring that back. That's that's about as inevitable as seeing a Metroid Prime or a Metroid on it or something like that. No more heroes has just got to be done. Yeah, that's that's the one one of the few games that would almost make me go buy a Switch. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I wonder if he saves on the John, just like in the the other game. Just in the other, I don't know, because this time they're sucked into a video game, so he's not saving back at his hotel. But ah. it's, it is continuing the story, and so... Um, I saw the trailer for this and the premise behind it. And I'm wondering how they're going to use the Joy-Cons because that's what made the original No More Heroes game so amazing is it actually properly used the motion controls. Yeah. And even though it looked really nasty, <laughs> but it, it was so, it was self aware of itself, it, like in the whole culture and everything. Like it was, it knew exactly what it was doing when it was self aware and breaking the walls and everything like that. And so Suda Fifty One, I always enjoy his stuff. Um. It frustrates me to no end that the No More Hero series is one of the few that it's not broke out beyond the Nintendo. I mean, sure, they put out a special edition of No More Heroes for the PlayStation 3 that has some extra stuff to use with the move. But this is something I would love to see in VR or like on some other system, Mm -hmm. not just Nintendo, because it's such a good game. Well, this this one's following up. It's like uh, there was uh, Batgirl. Uh, not bat girl. It's like bad girl or something like that. Had a bat. So bat and t- uh, Travis touchdown ends up killing, killing her off in the first game. So now you're talking about bad girl and bad man, bad girl and bad man. Yeah. yeah. So bad man's the father. Bad man comes and hunts down bad girl. Her not bad, bad girl, girl is one of the more psychotic bosses that you fight. Yeah. Yeah. She she's was. The one in, she's the one in the, uh, the baseball bullpen, isn't she? Baseball yeah. bullpen with the, with the frilly dress, and she's the one that was like hitting the. Uh, she's devilishly, <laughs> devilishly dis- difficult to fight as well. Yeah, she she was she would uh, take swings at basically people ran out on a conveyor belt in ball gags and you know everything like that and hit them towards you, mm-hmm. you know, just, just the terrible. lackeys and everything. <laughs> so you know, in this game, it's you know all, all we know is that you get sucked into the Phantom console because you're. Fighting bad, uh, bad man versus Travis touchdown. So you're gonna fight through the console, and you have to like collect like things from like six games before the villain does. So that way you can get released. Mm-hmm. But again, it's it's all wonderful referential humor. You know, very dark referential humor, but still very well, hopefully very uh, good. With the latest entries from Suda Five One and the the way that the, the studios have been handling him, I hope that they they let him go back to his roots and take off the reins because. I think the one that we, the one that he did with uh, was it was Suda Five One, uh, Shinji Mikami and Akira Yamaoka doing a game together. Strangely enough, uh oh, uh oh, we got uh, we, we have movement outside. Yeah, we got movement inside because of movement outside. <laughs> what is the what was the name of that? Was that um, was that the Hell's one? Uh oh, we just had a camera move. Yeah, we just had a camera shift. Let me go look at the camera real quick. All right. Keep talking. Uh-oh. So it was something of, I can't remember the name of it. I'm going to have to look it up here, but. Uh, yeah, that's not bad. Um, <laughs> it, it, hopefully we don't have to use that one. Well, is it Damnation? Was um, that the one they did? But, you know, while you're looking that up. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking it up. So, yeah, Nintendo Switch is going to be getting, I mean. Finally, has a game that I'm at least interested in. Besides the announcement of all these other indie games that are going to be coming to it, it was Shadows of the Damned. Shadows of the Damned. Yeah, 
Maybe okay. I can have um, to touch someone. And then lollipop chainsaw and and several other ones. Like the thing about it is that they always had this sort of like they were they were too worried about him getting too weird. I mean, the st- there are certain there are certain aspects of of the No More Heroes line. There are certain parts of Killer Seven, which is the thing that put him on the map, that were disturbing or non sequitur or you know felt like they were just departures from just triple A game. Yeah storytelling that kind of thing and so it almost felt like the the more that people wanted pseudo 5 one games and the more that he got to work on the more the studio was trying to just control him or keep that keep that that bent from getting out pseudo 51 and um who's the who's the guy from all solid uh, Snake. Um, <laughs> God, now it's going to be on the tip of my tongue. No, uh, Hideo Kojima. Yeah, Kojima. The, yeah. Don't control those two. Okay, let yeah. them be batshit crazy. Well, because- we already see what happens when you try to control Hideo Kojima. He leaves and starts his own game studio with blackjack and hookers. Right. Yeah. So those two sounds fun. Yeah. Th- those two make some amazing games. And Lollipop Chainsaw, I actually liked. It was I. It was a pretty decent game it you're right it was toned down compared to no more heroes but it was still a it was still a fun game for a hack and slash i mean it, it had it had all the right makings of a of a decent title yeah for sure i mean cheerleader takes on zombies with a chainsaw yep it it it's just you know i, I believe yahtzee said it best as his um as his light pop chainsaw reviews goes, is when you think of a pseudo five one game, typically you know that the words to describe it are getting less and less. I mean, Killer Seven is uh, an assassin with multiple personalities hunts down, but 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 like it's just this this paragraph long description just to even get close to identifying what the game is about, and that doesn't even come close. But you go you tra- you fast forward through, you know, No More Heroes, which is a nerdy assassin fights his way through 10 colorful bosses to fight the boss at the end and become the best assassin. I mean, it, it shortens down and you get to Lollipop Chainsaw and cheerleader fights zombies. Like that's, that is the, the whole reason for that game. Cheerleader fights zombies and, you know, to protect her family and mm-hmm. does it with her headless boyfriend. <laughs> Wouldn't it's, it be a pain in the ass though, carrying around a chainsaw to fight the zombies? Well, chainsaws versus zombies has been the thing. I think chainsaws these days um, have probably been portrayed uh, eviscerating zombies more than they've actually been portrayed cutting down trees. Yeah. (laughs) Or trimming bushes or anything like that. (laughs) Well, other things that are eviscerating is there's already warnings going up because Nintendo is just horrible to their fans. Mm -hmm. Is shortages of the SNES mini console and they're warning... uh, like all the business uh, sites are warning that the Nintendo Switch is going to face shortages over this holiday season. Yeah. So I know when I picked up my Switch it was one of the it was one of the two last ones in the store that I went to. Yeah. And I I had specifically asked if they had any of the ones with the the red and blue Joy-Cons, which is sort of like a special edition sort of thing. Um and apparently the guy who had asked just before me and was waiting there with me Got there first and asked for that one first, so yeah. he got it first. Ah. So I just got the, the one with the normal Joy Cons, which is still a Switch and it still plays the games really well. So I, I really glad I'm really glad that I got it. But yeah, I was like, oh man. They'd... So with all the indie games coming out for this, with Skyrim coming out for this, and some of the air games like Super Mario Odyssey and all, um, from a business aspect, mm. it's almost worth going out and buying up Nintendo Switches, sitting on them. And then waiting for Black Friday and everything like that around the holiday season, and then just start selling them off online. And you're going to probably end up uh, selling them for over four hundred dollars each as a profit. Well, four hundred is the MSRP. No, the three hundred is the MSRP. Uh, well, four hundred for the bundles. Yeah, yeah. But even if you're if you're buying the bundles, you're going to jack it up more. But these things, I think, are going to sell during the holiday season. We're going to see them sell hundred and fifty oh, to. Um, I really don't want to pay attention to shopping to for 200. like the week, the week surrounding Thanksgiving. I don't want to have anything to do with shopping. Yeah, don't even bring up holiday shopping. I'm, yeah. I'm just not looking forward to that. Yeah, I mean, it's it's <laughs> probably the the one time where you just see exactly how gross the the whole situation is. Like people just clamoring over each other, people getting trampled, children getting trampled, so somebody can buy you know the next shiny bit of. Hat that's gonna go collect dust in their house for 
you know. Well, it, that's. It, I mean, it's it's just ugly. Okay, you know? okay, old man. Look, okay, it is. We 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 are hitting we are hitting <laughs> the season where the stuff's starting to get announced. It's going to get released before the holidays mm-hmm. or the holiday shopping. And you know, talking about little bits of tat that are going to get. Uh, if you're help. going to get a switch, pre-order it or find it. Find a way to get it to you. Yeah, uh, because they're going to be hard to get. They're still going to be hard to get. It was hard to get them when they dropped, and it hasn't gotten any better. Yeah, and other things right now. Talking about little tidbits that are coming out is we have a Street Fighter Two Super Nintendo cartridge, 30th anniversary edition, being released that works on the original mm-hmm. Super Nintendo. Yeah, it's going to be a red cartridge. It's going to be a hundred dollars, and it is going to end up basically having the original. Uh, like an original style box, original style instruction manual, some extra things in it, and to be able to actually play it on the authentic console. Yeah. So, and it's going to be 100 bucks. So I think it's really cool. You I, know, I don't $100. think that's really cool that that specific site has sold out. Are people that insane? They're paying $100 for a game? There's only 5000 uh, five hundred and yes, it's a hundred dollars for a limited re-release. This moves out of a game release, and this moves into more like otaku kind of like collector, yeah, kind of realms where people go absolutely batshit. I'm just like so, seeing that. I saw that, and I just was like, does that come with the cons? A hundred dollars? What comes with this? Hundred dollars is cheap because <laughs> I mean, if you look at a lot of the collector Super Nintendo games, um. There's like Final Fantasy three, and there's a bunch of others that sell for a couple hundred in the box. Uh, Donkey Kong Country, uh, there's some Earthbound sell for more than this. Uh, there are Nintendo games that sell in the thousands of dollars. Are you serious? Mm-hmm. Yep. It's like the most the most rare Nintendo cartridge out there was um, some sort of special cartridge they had for a Nintendo competition. No track and field. Yeah. Is even more rare. Yeah. Than than the Nintendo Track comp- and Field, really? Yeah. Hmm. So but there was this really special one that's like um it was just it's not even a full game, it's like a collection of three games that they would use in the consoles for people to play during the competition. And I still believe like there's only a handful in existence. Yeah, because a lot of them got destroyed after the competitions. Yeah. So that's why I bet I bet if you found like an actual copy of that et one that would be worth a lot of money too because they well, threw nope. them all out in the they pulled them out of dump. the yeah they pulled them out of the landfill here as part of an archaeological dig oh. to like to like confirm it and i believe you i don't know if you can get one i mean i'm pretty sure they're out there in collector circles or something like that uh, maybe even some with some authentic landfill dirt still on them or something like that <laughs> i do know Ooh. that there is officially at least two or three that are donated to the smithsonian hmm. um and there is there is actually a small internet documentary about finding and digging up the, like fi- trying to figure out where they are and digging them up. Yeah, which is interesting. Now, after having seen the game myself, it's not worth. I mean, there's a reason that they so many units got dumped in the landfills because nobody like, liked it. If if I had worked that at that landfill before they went and dug all those up, I would have been out there trying to find them in the first place and mm-hmm. dug up my e- own couple <sighs> copies and e. sold them. No, ET is actually worthless because it was such a glut of games it's the ones that are limited produced uh like earthbound did not sell very well in the states it's worth like 500 dollars now mm-hmm. okay see my own personal holy grail of game collecting is a ps1 game that originally you saw a demo of it released with the inbox packing uh bundled copy of final fantasy 7 there was a demo disc that came with like mm-hmm. the armored core demo and everything on that on that dem on that disc was a demo for a game called intelligent cube um, which has seen certain iterations, the same development, you know, certain developers have come out with different things. There was one, one for kind of like it for the PSP. Um, there's been a couple of other things that came out, but the original Intelligent Cube was such a simple premise for a game. And I enjoyed the demo so much that I thought it was just guaranteed it was going to be out there. And I looked at stores over and over and over, never saw a copy. Come to find out, yeah, this was one of those limited release. It didn't get as much buzz as they thought it was going to get. And so it just, it didn't get put out as much as they, as they would normally put out games like your apocalypses with Bruce Willis mm-hmm. and that kind of thing. Yeah, I've, um, I've, I've lost a few games like that over time. Like I had Danger Girl, you can, which was a PlayStation One game. It was, now Intelligent Cube you can find online for roughly about 150, maybe less if you really look. 
um, or if you wouldn't get lucky at winning an auction. But it's certainly not the, the rarest of games. Mm. But it certainly is a game that I would like to have and play. And that's where I kind of fall out of the whole uh, collector side of things. It's like if I get something, if I buy a comic book, I want to read it. If I get a if I get a uh, toy, an action figure, I want to play it. If I buy trading cards because I want to trade them or play the game, it's not something I'm just going to take and shove off into some place somewhere and wait for it to appreciate in value or to hold on to it and you know barely ever even have any physical contact with it whatsoever and be like it's my precious. Hey, I have one of those. <laughs> okay, all. I have a few of those in video games. I mean, it's like I so because I'm a Hitchhiker's fan. And Douglas Adams, mm-hmm. you know, has passed away and no longer with us and all. And he was one of the, um, for a sci-fi writer, he was one of the first that I actually got into video games. And especially back in the 80s with the PC games, like he did uh, the Infocom games, like Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Yeah. But one of the ones that he did for Infocom was called Bureaucracy. I remember hearing about that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So Bureaucracy is this, you know, tongue-in-cheek game of trying to get an address change put in <laughs> through the red tape and the bureaucracy of the government and everything like that okay think, think well, it's like getting your driver's license these days yes it's, it's like that but you know it's that whole thing but you know lampooning the whole experience i managed to i managed to find a copy of bureaucracy sealed like never been opened with the original babbage's store um like MSRP was, in it. Like it was even imported. It wasn't yeah. imported. Babbage's <laughs> was in the U.S. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Mm-hmm. It used to be a software store, usually in malls. Mm-hmm. So I got I got this, like, 30-plus-year-old game, sealed, never been opened, on five and a quarter floppy, with all this little doodads and everything in there. I, I know it was a matter, manager, matter of a shrine after his death uh, as a way of memorializing Douglas Adams that they, for at least a uh, period of time, I don't know if it's still available, uh, made it so you could play the original Hitchhiker's Guide um, text adventure. They'd managed to port the code into a website. Yes, so you just go to a website. You could play. That's still there on the BBC. They yeah, did it for yeah. a thirty-year update. Yeah, you could go. You can go and play that. Um, I believe he had some some doing with the. There was an adventure-ish title called Titanic or Starship Titanic. Starship Titanic. Yep. Yeah, that's what it was. Um, and I remember reading the book of which he inspired, but I don't. I mean, he only had uh, he had creative input on on making. Mm-hmm. But it was written by somebody else, and the game had once again it was more of a pr- produced by Douglas Adams, or you know he had creative input. Yeah, um, I so. need I need to go grab some water here for over there. So. <laughs> <laughs> up and down, I'm... up and down. Oh. <sighs> you should well, have put it over here. All right. Well, then in the realm of in the realm of collecting, of course, we have our wonderful pop vinyl collection here. Um, Boss Pander here made it a point of pointing out. Um, that the Night King and the Zombie Ver- Viserion, is I saying v- that right? Viserion. Viserion. Yeah. Uh, are coming in Funko Pop form. Isn't he cute? Viserion, he cute. Is, Viserion yeah. is like so cute. I'm going to try and find it. Of course, we do already have, let me see if I can get these names right. Uh, Jackin Hagar <laughs> and Leanna Mormont. I don't know anything. I don't watch Game of Thrones, folks. Um, You're missing out. Nah, fuck it. Too, too popular. Mm-hmm. Haven't got to it see the last my... season because we don't have cable right now. So sad. It, yeah, it's, it's just, it offends I, me. I actually learned online about poor Viserion. <laughs> <laughs> Made me very sad. Oh, I think I saw that clip, but, yeah. But, yeah, zombie Viserion is so cute. Just so cute. <laughs> that is that is a pretty cute looking dragon. <laughs> Um, the Night King looks absolutely scary. Yeah. I'd hate to have he, that. He's still sort of cute. He's, uh, his big old eyes. I'd hate to have that in a kid's room, to tell you the truth. Now, I will admit, there have been a line of Funko Pops, um, pop vinyls that came out that I had to, I had to like slap my wrist and push myself away from buying because they have come out. Um, I went looking, they have come out with another line of, uh, Borderlands. Uh-uh. Really? <laughs> pop vinyls. So uh, the only one that I technically uh, am involved with is this uh, this wonderful Alice in Wonderland, which I donated and gave as a gift mm-hmm. as its its con merch. Um, that is the only one I've ever paid money for. Um, otherwise, I look at this mm-hmm. stuff and two words pop into my head, and I will always say this whenever these this topic comes up: Beanie Babies. 
<laughs> right. I watch this. I, I mean, I have. I, I want to play with them, but then, like, seriously, if I were to ever take them out of their boxes, I I think Harrison would kill me. Because <laughs> um, <laughs> he's like, they're collectibles. Don't take them out of the box. But I'm like, I want to play with them. Well, they, <laughs> you can always buy two. That, that, that's I, my, I could. That's my thing with it is like, if you want to play with it, you should buy two typically. Um, I only, well, I got an extra Atlas. From Titanfall and hmm. yeah, maybe we should actually open one of those up to play with. Yeah, because because that one set, that one set we got extras of. So and they're so I mean they're so simplistic. This one, I mean you know the Night King and the Sarion uh, look like they've have a lot of effort put into them. You know to make make them look more like their their character counterparts. Yeah. When I look at when I look at just the pop vinyls in general. I mean, they're all sort of just samey. They have small detail changes that don't really differentiate them much beyond mm -hmm. they have this identifiable sort of aesthetic. And once again, that brings up the whole Beanie Baby thing where they had like 30 different types of a teddy bear. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, you, you don't understand the kind of craze. If you've never been there, You, I mean, if you don't know what it was, you weren't there. The oh, Lord. <laughs> um, there, there is actual f like footage of a divorce court proceeding where they had to bring in like two or three garbage bags full of Beanie Babies and sit there while the husband and wife, who were going through this divorce, divided out these uh, stuffed animals based on value, collector value, yeah. to make sure that they both got a fair value of the two because it was just they had so many of them and it was such a huge investment. And some of them are just the prices are outrageous. The ones that are typically outrageous are the con exclusive ones, mm -hmm. like the San Diego Comic Con and stuff like that. I'm going to be interested. In, I'm going to be going to Salt Lake City Comic Con in September this month, and um, I'll be interested in seeing what might be there as an exclusive or what I might be able to come back mm -hmm. with. So hopefully I'll have a report for you guys. I know getting con footage is not exactly my focus mm -hmm. when I go to these things because I've done, <laughs> I've done um, C2E2. And I've done I've done Salt Lake City Comic Con before. I've done we've done local cons here, and we tried to get some footage for you. So, you know, we're not good. we're not the best. At we're that not yet. the best at that. We don't. I don't think if you guys yeah, really need, want to know about I it, I need you one could, of those. What did they wear on the motorcycles? The the head ones. The action cams. The action yeah, cams. The, yeah. They got a name though, but yeah, I need one of those. Yeah, I need a GoPro for the next con, so I don't actually have to carry it around and stuff. I could just go run around con. I think we might like do something. That. We might do something with that. I have access to a, a couple of GoPros. So there's yeah. also I've seen um, chest straps for the cell phone, so it sits here. Yeah. So that way yeah. you don't have to worry about that either. I don't know. I feel like a yeah, total but then goof. everybody'd be looking at. Well, I guess you yeah. know they're probably already <laughs> all depending on your costume. A, a female, they'd probably already be looking at your boobs. But there's a Bob Ross pop vinyl. Of course, Who? there is. You don't know who Bob Ross is? Oh, yes, him. Let, let's we're just gonna put a happy, happy little, tree little tree over here, right here. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. There's not just um, <laughs> there's not just a Bob Ross pop vinyl. There's Bob Ross everything. He still shows up. Uh, I think he's being streamed twenty four seven still on Twitch TV. His shows <laughs> are. I mean, the man is just a legend. Yeah. Well, you know, you've made it though. If you get to be a pop vinyl. But that posthumously, I mean, because he's dead. Posthumously? Yeah, whatever. <laughs> posthumously, whatever. <laughs> Shh. <laughs> I'm, well, speaking of other things that uh, are going to be coming out for this holiday season, it looks like we have uh, two things. One, we have the, fall uh, the Microsoft Fall Creator Update 2 for Windows 10. That's going to be coming out October 2016. Another one? Yes, they well. They've already said they're going to have like basically a service pack essentially every uh, twice a year. But the Fall Creator update is to get ready for their mixed reality. Okay, and why why are we not calling it augmented reality anymore? Uh, I there's three different types. There's mm -hmm. virtual reality, mixed reality, and augmented reality. Now, mm -hmm. augmented reality is like the Google glasses. Virtual reality is like having it fully on your head. I think the mixed reality is where you, I don't know. Just <laughs> where I don't know. <laughs> I was just waiting for that bullshit to fall flat. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
Sap- you might want to look it up. No, I actually, I actually, the Sapper has actually read up on this. Like augmented yeah. reality is <laughs> supposed to enhance your regular viewing experience. Like, uh, like if you were to go look at a statue. And a little message window pops up saying, this is the history behind the statue. So it's like an annotation. Yeah, annotation. That's okay. the augmented reality. Mixed reality is you still can see the, the room. And you're looking at basically a motorcycle or a dolphin fly through it. Or the mixed reality is Hybrid. like... The, 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 the mixed reality is like the... Merging the, the, of real and virtual wait, worlds. So the mixed reality is like the Force Friday game that's being sold right now for $200. You can buy a kit that has a mixed reality headset for $200 and a special glowing lightsaber to allow you to fight holograms of Jedis. Mm. Okay? And so that's part of this whole Force Friday, too. That's the mixed reality, okay? That's, that's so it's it's that they couldn't they couldn't push augmented reality on because augmented reality has been around since we've had the ability of pointing a camera at something and have it be processed by a computer, i.e., smartphones and DSs, DSIs. Most notoriously, came with AR cards and had some sort of some sort of AR component to them. But that was more just trying to set up a way of you playing your game um, in the real world, like on a kitchen table or a countertop or something like that. Right, a school lunch table or something like that but i will say even with this mixed reality thing that we're talking about it's actually vr Mm -hmm. okay um it sounds like vr is just not vr where they have to force you into a virtual space they they just superimpose that on top of the space you already occupy basic kind of but that's, that sounds a little bit more believable. But this is still virtual reality this is 100 percent virtual reality there's no reason it should be called mixed reality um so the micros so what's coming out coming out with the holodeck Oh, God. Let's see. Allow me to nerd out on this a little bit. Um, there's no, not going to be any kind of device that you're going to be able to put on your person and to actually give you the sense, the, the same sensations that the holodeck would be capable of doing. <laughs> the holodeck itself is a master of tech, uh, a master work of technology in, in the fact that you just walk into it and it creates this world. Not only does it create this world, but it makes it an infinite world within an enclosed space. Mm-hmm. Because That'd it be moves so around cool. you. Well, we're not going to see that. Yeah. Okay. But the thing is with the mixed reality, that's getting ready for it. So there are heads, virtual reality headsets coming out from four manufacturers to start. Acer, Lenovo, mm-hmm. Dell, and HP. The prices on these, and well, there's Asus also. Mm-hmm. But the four we're talking about, the prices on them are about... 300 to 350 for the headset. If you want it with the controls, it's an extra $100. Okay. The controls are very much like the, like the Oculus Rift controllers, but people say that the controllers aren't really as ergonomically designed. Um, they don't which, look it. No, no. Yeah. Which is what's odd because Microsoft's well, been making hardware for like keyboards and mice forever. You can argue that Microsoft is responsible for taking what was already an uh, an all right controller design, i.e. the anal- the dual dual shock analog controller from a PS a PlayStation, and making it better. Not the first iteration, because no. remember the the, the big, Duke the Duke. Yeah, yeah. I remember the Duke controllers were this like thing that you just had to rest on your lap and treat them like a keyboard. Like they were these gigantic controllers, but all they had to do was take that. And rework it to be a little bit smaller and a little bit, you know, more form fitting for the hand. And now, I mean, they just, they didn't necessarily have to change anything really between the Xbox 360 and the Xbox One controllers. So it's weird to go from something that is just that well designed, and they can't figure out a way to split that in half and give you that same kind of ergonomic connection. And they have to do this kind of weird thing with the rings and the the hard the hard edges and stuff like that. Well, the rings are important because they have DOS on it for tracking with the VR headset. Mm-hmm. So, what the unique advantage to this is basically it uses the um, the Hollow lenses, the Microsoft mm-hmm. Hollow lenses uh, inside out technology. It has two cameras on it and it's able to track there without having to have external sensors. Yeah. Now, what's the interesting thing? Because we're like, okay, this is our VR headset being pushed out by four mm-hmm. companies. You know, the price sounds great at 400 bucks or whatnot, or under 400 because we're talking 300 350 without the controllers. What makes it interesting is, one, you have the Windows Store, which a lot of people don't necessarily use, but it has a large platform behind it. But mm-hmm. two is we have – it's going to be working with Steam VR, okay? 
So it's actually going to be working and competing with the HTC Vive. And, Which, uh, you know, I coming. Think, you know, well, the Vive still has that you have to have the outside. The outside things, yes. Things. Like what, two yeah. or three cameras? Lighthouses. The sensors, you know? but so. So, but this is not going to use less sensors. You still have to plug it into into uh, the PC via HDMI. It still uses one USB port versus the two that the Oculus uses mm-hmm. or the uh, or the H2C does. But three hundred dollars is impressive. That's an amazing price point, yeah. especially for some sort of emergent technology. I mean, but I I like the I like the the bent of wearable technology as it's going down because I remember you know being elated when I said I was. I got the email saying I was accepted into the Google Glass beta program mm. and that elation immediately just evaporating when I go to sign up and it says all you have to do is give us is buy it for some ungodly amount of money like $1,500, $2,000 or something like that. Like when you people see people wearing those, when you saw them wearing those, they don't exist anymore. Mm. When you saw people wearing those, I never thought, oh, hey, there's a thing that looks like it costs $2,000. I was like, that looks goofy as hell. Well, the doctors still yeah. wear them. The doctors use them, yeah. yeah. So there is a corporate. But a- that was like one of the first real wearable things in my in my memory that wasn't some sort of just wrist strapped PDA mm-hmm. kind of kind of deal. And now that um, we have the VR goggles going from it is they went they went into two different camps. It was either the the high end VR goggles that were designed to do this mm-hmm. this sort of professional display, and you were essentially a buying a form of monitor mm-hmm. monitor and input system. Versus um, the cheap, shitty headsets that you would just slide your phone into yeah. and do a little finagling to try and get it to work and be able to enjoy some sort of VR content uh, off of the internet or anything without having to hook up to a different device, without having to pay out of your pocket for a major piece of technology. But even those had their had their draw their drawbacks. Like you know, if you put your phone in this thing, you can't touch your phone. You can't control yeah. it really. Right. So. Well, now moving into this augmented reality thing, the price point keeps getting lower. I believe if they can find a way to make the phones themselves kind of form fitting or wrap around mm-hmm. and become the goggles in, in a way, you know, being able to design that, um, that we're just going to see a further ela- a further elaboration or iteration on top of this. I wonder if that's yeah, what wonders. You be able to answer your phone and stuff. I, mm, I wonder if that's what wonders actually going to be working on. So mm. I wonder. I wonder. Mm. I wonder. I wonder. I wonder. I wonder what Wonder's was, doing with VR with all these announcements. I haven't said boo I bet it's on that. Wonderful. Forum. <laughs> yeah. Well, we're gonna have to keep wondering because yeah. they're still insanely tight lipped, even with all these other announcements. But I'm actually excited about for VR this time because for at three hundred to three hundred fifty dollars, that's the price of a good monitor. These the resolution on these headsets are at fourteen forty p. Uh, 1440 by 1440 is higher than the HTC Vive and the Oculus Rift. Mm-hmm. So it's a higher resolution in them. It costs less and it's going to be able to run even on lower end hardware. It's still going to run at 90 frames per second mm-hmm. or 60 on lower hardware. But they're talking about Minecraft, mm-hmm. Ark Survival Evolved, Halo. Yeah. Okay. In the gaming sense. And this is with all the other big hitters coming out. But some of the other things that for the more common people is the fact that there's going to be Hulu <laughs> and there's going to be uh, game. There's going to be video stuff in there. So more basically, yeah, people. so basically you hook this into your laptop and you can watch essentially on a movie theater, you know, type screen, whatever show or movie you want to. So it's a it's sort of a, like a, sim- a simulated theater, ex- theatrical experience. Yes. Um, what we really, what remains just to be seen is exactly how. back all comfy. You just. Yeah, what mm-hmm. remains to be seen is exactly how audio is going to be delivered using these devices. I see things like super hot. Um, it really does come down to the same thing I've said about virtual reality ever since we even mentioned covering the mm-hmm. Oculus Rift and at the very, very early parts of this when we started doing the show. Probably comes right out of your phone. I mean, mm-hmm. no, this is jack, PC. The phone this jack. is PC. Oh. PC. So there's actually a headset. There's actually like a port or there's something on it something. to plug in head, head headphones. headphones. So you can use whatever type of headphones you want. I mean, that that probably is going to be the best option just because more people are still using the, the 3.5 millimeter jack headphones and headsets instead of, you know, Bluetooth or earbuds or something like that. They're still working on that technology. Um, but I still maintain that the one thing that's going to make VR, I mean, yeah, shrinking it down, making it more affordable, making it so it's not like you have to not just buy the headset, but upgrade your PC system in order for it to work. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
and keep that price point low is one thing. Shrink down the technology so it doesn't look like this big, goofy, like overblown ski goggle mm-hmm. kind of arrangement <laughs> is is going to be a big a big part about that. There, once that technology gets more and more mini- miniaturized, the, the better it's going to cur- turn out. But also, it means that if it get if we get this into the hands of more consumers, we're going to see more developer adoption, and that's what's really kind of flagging right now. Is they're they're trying to uh, entice. Indie developers are trying to entice um, mobile development. Um, so the things like showing off the the movie theater thing with your Hulus and your Netflixes and stuff like that, that's fine. Um, Silver.tv. I'm seeing a lot of names here that I just don't recognize. Well, there's, there's a lot in there, too. Because, I mean, look, from a gaming perspective, this holiday season, probably actually 20... We're going into 2018. It's going to be the year that we're going to finally see the big titles with VR. This is the year where we're going to probably see the push out because now we have devices at $300. Mm-hmm. We have Fallout 4. We have Skyrim. We have, we have Ark Survival Evolved. We, we have, have Minecraft. We, we have, have Halo. We have Doom. Yeah. But you got to think, right? You got two, three kids or adults mm-hmm. that want, you know, <laughs> that want to play. Then you got to buy multiple headsets too. It's it's not like these controllers you're paying twenty bucks for. Well, people have to buy multiple computers nowadays. Yeah, we're seeing we're seeing you a computer it's... and at least a con a gaming console in a lot of cases for mm-hmm. each TV that yeah. is in the house. Yeah. And we're getting to the point where there is almost a television in every room available in the house. Yeah, it's like every kid, every adult in the house has to have a separate. You know, desktop, laptop, phone, TV, mm-hmm. VR headset now. Yeah, and th- this is not uncom- <sighs> this is not uncommon. And the thing is, is like you can't could- buy them a box anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I almost because of the virtual desktops, you know, you could almost use the VR as a multi-screen display and do all your work in there. You know, as a potential thing for three hundred dollars versus looking at monitors all day long I, you're still looking at monitors all day long yeah you might get a headache too wearing well, that all day I mean, this, just the pressure and just having that on your head nuts. and like what? eye strain and and motion sickness you know it's the same thing that's happened and the younger people are going to adopt to it faster than the older people because i remember when first person shooters first came out um a lot of people complained about nausea with them mm-hmm. the people that were younger got accustomed to them i mean the sense about the only one that still gives me issues because you're moving in space and yeah i don't course going through corkscrews in there screws with you something awful i don't i didn't necessarily have a problem with the 360 freedom of descent or it, uh, the only thing that really kind of started getting me i never had a problem with most modern shooters or first person view or anything like that the one the thing that started getting me was the herky-jerky glory kill system of doom and once you realize you don't need to do that every time it becomes available, because it's just kind of a it's just kind of a health and ammo refill, and otherwise you can just run around ripping and tearing as much as you like and get away with it. Um, I was fine. Uh, it's just the way the FOV changes and the fact that you're just constantly leaping forward all the time that just really set me off there. The, the thing that really gets me these days and why I can't play games like Mirror's Edge are is Vertigo, the the sense of being up very very high or that I might fall is how are you going to make it through sky factory <laughs> I, th- I think just portal still the one that just gives me a headache if i play too long i actually in sky factory when i played it and i pointed this out to you when i when we when we started playing it together i don't get that vertigo not yet um the because you're floating in a void once you get down from the initial tree yeah and so it's almost like there's i mean it the 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 sense of emptiness kind of works with it so that i'm not given a uh, a, a matter of depth. I don't have a perception of the depth, the the endlessness that's down there. It's more that's just, you know, an anti floor. The, the like that's the floor that's lava. Oh, okay. In, in a sense, so I just don't want to step off because I just know that's death. They don't care. I don't care how they portray the, portray the death. That's just death. You could ch- you could probably change something like Sky Factory into it's just lava everywhere until you build out into it, and that would work just as fine for me. Hmm. Per se. It's it's the same premise, and so I don't really get that vertigo uh, unless I fall. I get a, if I fall and I get a really a real sense of falling, then I get a, a flash of it. But that's only at the time, and it's it's a lot better than, than something like Mirror's Edge, where you're up high, leaping over the roofs of buildings that are skyscrapers that are just so in, insanely tall, 
and you can look down at any moment and go, Ooh, I need to sit down for a bit. <laughs> we're we're gonna we're gonna have to find a VR game that's gonna do that to you now. <laughs> oh, I hate you. <laughs> there is one. There is one I pointed out um, early on in the VR thing, which is um, they put you on this. They stand you in a room and they put you on this plank. And in VR, what you're seeing is that there's this plank out in this like skyscraper that's being developed, and it's just a straight drop down. And there's a kitten out at the edge of the plank, and you have to get out there and rescue the kitten. Kitten. Yeah, and I mean, I would be on my hands and knees crawling out there, <laughs> just like complaining the whole way. <laughs> that, that wouldn't that wouldn't bother me because I just I know that it wasn't real. We we're gonna have to put this to the test. I mean, I th- I think in 2018 we're finally gonna be able to. I hope we'll be able to show off some VR content for you folks. Uh, if you're interested, fun. let us know down in really the comments. Fun. You know, let it let us know about the, the the VR stuff that you've seen that you find intriguing or that you think we should check out. Definitely. Yeah, that's. Yeah. I think that's going to get put into the roster because of the price point. Finally, finally, it's yeah. been such. It's been such a hard thing to break into, just because it's expensive as hell. Yeah, just um, monumentally so. Yeah. So, oh, do we have anything else? Any quick I'm, takes or anything? I'm pretty tapped as it is. So yeah, I think I think we're pretty much wrapped up this week hmm. here. Okay. Everything seems to be pretty much rehashing. Rehashing. Well. Slow news week, I guess. Yeah. No, not mm-hmm. really. Oh. You you always wanted to be a slow news week. <laughs> yes, okay. I do. It's, it's less, always a slow news week. It's slash. less work for me. There, I have it's, less it's to... It's just you're seeing a lot about a lot of other things in like, the news right you now. Guys, you guys don't understand that there are some very tedious parts about editing this show. This is a one-take show, so at least that keeps it easy on me. Yes. <laughs> very rarely do I have to like edit out something or anything like that. But then there's the comes the write-up. The SEO, the tagging, like coming up with different things to put in the tags, having to pare down those tags because YouTubes are bastards and only let you have like a certain length of the tags. It's like, come on, it's SEO. Let me tag the shit. Yep. Bastards. And then um, not only that, but when I post this thing on audio to get disseminated out to iTunes and Google, um, I have to type up the I have to type up the description for the original post. And that's the thing that gets put out to somewhere. somewhere. Then I have to retype it. I have to retype it in a different way. So that it shows up as the preview kind of text for iTunes. Then I have to take that and retype it an entirely different way so that it shows up as the preview for Google Play. <laughs> so I have to write the same thing three different ways every goddamn week. Huh. <laughs> yeah. It sounds like college. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, all right. This has been the GAC podcast. Uh, you can listen to us on iTunes and on Google Music. Mm-hmm. You can find us in video format on Vidme and YouTube. Uh, make sure you also check us out on Twitter and Facebook. And we will see you next time. Take care, folks. Later. Look at me, I'm a virtual reality headset. <laughs> okay. Yeah, you got the goggles on, you got the ears in, you got the thing strapped to your thing, this one. <laughs> we've seen we've seen those <laughs>